Dr. Pretzky, great to see you again, and thanks for coming. Thank you. So, um, Dr. Pretzky, I, I have to say, you know, I, I always do appreciate hearing people's journey to where they got into medicine and what got them excited about getting into medicine. Yours is a very different journey. Um, tell us what inspired you to get uh, to where, where you wanted to dedicate your life to treating patients with vision, uh, vision impairment. Well, I, I mean, in some ways it's, uh, it's very predictable in other ways. It's not, I had a sort of, uh, eclectic upbringing, um, in a household that valued several different things. One being medicine and healthcare. My, my father was a retina surgeon and my mother was a nurse anesthetist. So in that respect, it was not really a surprise that I was exposed to this field very young and kind of spent a lot of time around it. But another major uh, emphasis growing up was art. Um, the arts broadly, but visual art specifically. And uh, so I, that's what I studied uh, as an undergraduate. I felt it was not a fair compromise to have to give one up for the other. So I, I chose to go, rather than studying art in an academic art school kind of route, I went to a liberal arts college where I could uh, basically prepare for medical school and study art at the same time. So I, my, my academic background as an undergraduate was, was in painting. And during medical school, I actually, if, if you were to look at my CV, there's a whole section of publications, most of which are medical illustrations, actually. Oh, interesting. Yeah. You know, it's not unusual. Um, uh, there are many of our very, you know, impressive scientists, impressive, you know, uh, clinicians, with, with, you know, the kind of, you know, amazing education like you've had, who also are, you know, express themselves through art. It, 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 there's, there's some benefit to apparently having your, your uh, analytical mind functioning really highly when you're doing art or your, um, or maybe it's your compassion mind as it relates to you in, in, in medicine. Well, I, I think that, um, you know, that there's a couple of different levels to it. Um, number one, I mean, I think uh, the practice of art or the appreciation of art does benefit a physician or a physician in training. Um, you know, and that's why you see medical schools doing things like, at least in New York City, uh, where, I, where I trained, you know, the, they bring medical school classes to, to the Met to take art appreciation courses and things. And some of that can be a little bit, uh, can be a little bit on the nose, you know, like diagnosing paintings, you know, and working on observation skills. I, I think it's a little bit more uh, abstractly humanitarian in reality than, than something as concrete as just looking at pictures. But I also think that, you know, ophthalmology in particular is, a, is, is obviously something that uh, we care for people's vision. And so visual arts and, I, there's a poetic connection for me. I did not start out thinking I was going to do ophthalmology. Um, my original intention in medical school, or at least what I thought I was going to do, was orthopedic surgery. Mm. And um, ultimately, ophthalmology ended up sort of turning the light bulb on for me. But, uh, and it felt good. And I, I think that some of that is. You know, I, I obviously am a very visually oriented person and helping to provide other people with vision is, is important. And then on a, on a, not to keep belaboring this, but um, you know, what people sometimes fail to realize with our education in terms of becoming a physician, there's not, unless you are a 
molecular scientist, physician scientist who's doing really heavy duty research on some of the stuff, which obviously we need those people. They're very important. We rely on them in our department and in others. And, but that's not my background. And as a primarily clinical practicing physician, um, I think it's the skills outside of the classroom that were really important. So I also was an, a very active athlete uh, in college, I was on the rowing team and I raced bicycles competitively and I played every sport in high school because I went to a very small high school. And if you played one sport, you had to kind of play them all. And I had to sort of justify these kinds of things when I would go on interviews. Well, why do you want to be an ophthalmologist? And, you know, why didn't you follow a more typical path, you know, biology or chemistry or something in undergrad? And pre-med, what have you. And I truly think that the things that prepared me most for when I'm actually in the operating room doing surgery were athletics and art. Interesting. Because athletics provides you with a degree of um, performance anxiety coping mechanisms. I think if you were a musician, it would be the same thing or, or a performance artist of any kind, you know, actor or uh, it would be similar. So the, the, the ability to perform without kind of getting too nervous and then. Yeah, no, I, I get it. Yeah. The art also provided painting has a lot of technical overlap with surgery. I could see that. Yeah. So Certainly I, skills with your hands and yeah. 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 So it's not, not to just drone on about it, but you know, yeah. well, I, no, I get it. It was I, a I perfectly just... natural progression. I, it, people like to, people like to talk about how, kind of, I don't know, uh, unique it is or something. But I, to me, it just seems perfectly organic. Well, it, I, I agree. And, and this is one of the fun things about doing the interviews and, and I think for people to get to know more about our physicians. And, and, uh, and actually, I, I, I'll have to, we'll, we'll talk after the interview because I'm racing in a skull this Saturday. So I actually <laughs> get the rowing thing. So, um, so uh, now, what you're doing now and in, in, in coming to this department of really strong retina program and, and, um, and, you know, what we're, what all the things that we're doing in research and clinical work and um, what, a, it, you know, it seems like it'd be a very exciting opportunity for someone who, you know, as young as you are in your career, I can say that I, I have the liberty to say that, but the, uh, but it must be really exciting. And, and, um, and are you, looking towards some of those things for your for yourself in that are really you know driving your interest in terms of what you want to do clinically and how we can help patients are, are there some certain aspects of being here with this team at the University of Pittsburgh that makes that um, advantageous for you well you know I had everyone had sort of assumed that I would uh, return to my roots so to speak and and join the practice that my my dad was a partner in and and you know basically work in private practice and and that practice in central Pennsylvania is very very uh, I mean it's a wonderful practice uh, having been successful for a long time I mean it was almost like a crazy opportunity to to yeah look away from but for me, um, some of the opportunities presented with the growth here in Pittsburgh, I think were um, too exciting to, to let pass by. I mean, not many people are as fortunate as I am to have basically a, an opportunity to be working here where we have a new eye center in the process where we have a growing um, uh, place of prominence kind of on the national landscape of ophthalmology, partially because we're building the eye center. And it allows us to, to innovate on things that are not so easy necessarily. And, and so 
whether it be pushing surgical techniques further or new technologies or new treatment modalities, which are all things that are happening. Um, not to mention being a part of, a, of an academic community was very, very uh, appealing to me. I, I love teaching. I like having the opportunity to work with residents and fellows. I'm very passionate about this. Um, I really love ophthalmology and to be able to share that passion with everybody from, from med students to residents to fellows is something that I would have really missed in private practice. Um, you know, obviously all, all physicians have the opportunity to teach whether they're in private or academic practice because we teach our patients and that's really important. But um, as stressful as it can be sometimes to teach surgery, it's a very rewarding thing because it allows you to um, grow your um, output, you know, exponentially. So every, every, and this is something that I learned from, from Dr. Eller, you know, I mean, over the years, how many people he has taught and how many people have gone on to take care of patients or gone on to teach other people. So it becomes this um, amazing footprint in the world that mm -hmm. they had. And so to, to be able to have that opportunity is really, really uh, also romantic in a way. Uh -huh. um, but that being said, <laughs> I think it, the, the really exciting thing is the new eye center yeah. and being able to be a part of building something new, building a, from the ground up, you know, we will have operating rooms that are optimized for what we need. And we will have, um, you know, research facilities that complement the clinical side. And we will be able to hopefully have better relationships with um, partners, who uh, even potentially an industry where that kind of relationship can be a little bit sticky, but it's necessary in a field that is so technolo technology driven as ophthalmology, mm -hmm. you can't operate or practice in a bubble where you just wait for other people to make those innovations. And you can't make the innovations without the people who actually produce the products. So, right. um, you know, hopefully, the, the new eye center is a very fertile ground for all of that. Well, I, I, I think you're right. And I think it will be. And I certainly can see that, you know, uh, a lot of the innovation that um, will be affecting people, particularly with retinal disorders, will be coming out of Pittsburgh in the future, where um, it maybe came from other places in the past. Uh, but uh, we're already seeing that. And, and that that should be, and I would imagine a, a, you know, a very good thing for you in looking to, to how your patients can benefit from some very new and cutting edge technologies or new um, clinical trials that people can, can benefit from being involved with. And um, so I, I, I imagine that's a really good opportunity for someone who's, who's trying to um, really stretch their, their own, uh, you know, interest in, in what you're trying to do for your patients. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I, because I grew up around ophthalmology, I, you know, I have some memory of things that perhaps I shouldn't in terms of what ophthalmology was like more than 15 years ago before we had the advent of um, some of the current treatments that have become standard for macular degeneration and diabetes and uh, things that 15, 20 years ago would have been unthinkable we're able to, to do now um, because of some of these medications. Now, I have grown up almost envying those people who practiced during the time when that was being innovated because modern vitreoretinal surgery um, is not really much older than the 1950s or 60s. And, in, and really the majority of what we do didn't really start coming into uh, practice until really the 1980s or even early 90s. And so it's a fairly young field, even though ophthalmology is the oldest sort of board certified 
specialty that exists in medicine outside of like internal medicine. It is, it has been around a long time. Ophthalmology as a separate field. Uh, the kind of things that we can do now in retina really are not that old. So there are, you know, my father's generation kind of in, or the generation, that sort of half generation before him, they're the ones who sort of invented everything we do. And so I have, I have to say it's very exciting to be here where it feels like we're on the cusp of some new um, steps in the, in the evolution of the field. And so I do think that we have the potential to make some of those steps here in Pittsburgh because of the facilities and, and the growth that's happening. Well, I think that's good news for all of us. Um, I, I, may have shared with you before. I mean, my, my family history for macular degeneration, for sure, my mother had it. And, and so I think we're all hoping that down the road, these are things that we'll have many more answers for and many more solutions for. Um, so, and I imagine for you being, you know, a clinician um, that that could be, you know, nothing could be more important for all the people that you're treating. And, and um, so well, th yeah. thank you. Thank you for sitting with us, talking about yourself. Very interesting, yeah. <laughs> and uh, and it's always it's always good. And and you know, I I, I know that your patients are all very excited about um, you know uh, spending time with you and the care that you provide. I hear that often, and so um, it's it's good for us to have a chance to to uh, hear hear a little bit more about the work that you're doing and the things that that are important to you. So, thank you for your time today. I appreciate it. Thank you.